This is Duke University. Thank you. Um, I'm Eileen Chow, and on behalf of Claire Woods and Carlos Rojas, who can't be here today, and Max Allen, um, we are Story Lab. This is actually part of a two year long series that we've been hosting, and it's called Scholars and Storytelling. And part of the Story Lab initiative was really to think story, talk story, <laughs> make stories, um, and also research stories. And one of our um, uh, and scholars and storytelling was really started as a way of showcasing to one another what we're doing with stories and storytelling in our own research, in our pedagogy, in our daily lives, in our activism, um, in our everyday practices. And so uh, we want to bring in people from all disciplines, all fields, um, professions to really share their insights into what we consider stories, what we consider storytelling. The larger motto of Story Lab, which is um, one of the humanities labs at Franklin Humanities Institute, um, has always been to really think about how no stories are told alone, that we are always, stories are always, and texts are always part of a community, part of a readership, part of people who tell them, retell them, share them, critique them, um, and pass them along to other completely different and disparate generations and communities. And so uh, one of, and we also have several research um, areas. And one of our research areas that's primarily been helmed by Claire Woods and Car Carlos has been really to think about also environmental narratives and to think about the ways in which, actually our group has a much darker title. We're actually called Extinction Narratives. Um, and in fact, our first, I think our first gathering was all about how will the human species go extinct and everybody said yes. But, um, but Extinction Narratives is precisely the kind of work that we like to be thinking of at Story Lab. We combine both thinking about science fiction, uh, dystopian novels. We've read a lot of dystopian novels, and now we're all utterly depressed. And we also look at science. We look, we talk to scientists. We look at, um, we have colleagues from the environmental school um, together to really think about both praxis, to think about research, to think about theory, and maybe to think about potential alternative, happier outcomes. But uh, as um, you know, when we want to have a concluding event for this year, both in terms of the scholars and storytelling, but also in terms of our narratives of extinction research group, we thought of um, we're thinking about wonderful speakers that we'd like to bring in, and the person that actually popped up immediately for all of us was John Jarvis, former director of the National Park Services. Um, I will actually leave an introduction to him and to his illustrious career to a colleague, um, Professor Bob Healy, emeritus of the Nicholas School and also the local Sierra Club director. Yes? I'm the executive yeah. committee. Yeah, okay, executive committee. And so, and he will um, introduce our speaker today. But I just want to welcome you to um, our final event of the year on LDOC, when you could be partying drunkenly on campus. Um, and maybe you will later, but, uh, but that today we'll first begin with this event. I just want to give a special shout out to Deborah Jensen, um, director of FHI, who's been so supportive of Story Lab, and we're really grateful that, for that. Thank you. So, and Professor Healy. All right, well, I think we have today somebody who uh, should have some very interesting stories to tell. Uh, Jonathan Jarvis uh, retired in January after an eight-year term as the director of the U.S. National Park Service. Uh, author Wallace Stegner called our national parks the best idea we ever had. They're uh, a bastion against extinction. They're beloved by Americans, and uh, they've been copied all over the world. Uh, the uh, the uh, empire that uh, Mr. Jarvis uh, recently stepped down from running has 20,000 employees. There's over 400 major units and hundreds of minor units going from the, uh, the gates of the Arctic in Alaska to the uh, Cape Hatteras National Seashore near us. Uh, he is a uh, graduate of the uh, College of William and Mary. He's a career civil servant with almost 40 years uh, working for the government. Uh, and uh, he started out uh, as a, uh, a seasonal interpreter, so there is, is hope for all uh, in uh, ascending the ladder. So uh, let's give a, uh, a warm Duke and Durham welcome to uh, Jonathan Jarvis.
Uh, thanks, Bob, and uh, thank you to the Institute for the invitation and great hospitality and great food. And um, um, so I'm going to talk for maybe 25 minutes or something like that uh, with the program. Um, and then I hope we have lots of time for questions. So begin to be thinking about what you want to talk about. Um, and I'm open to, I no longer work for the government, so I can say just about anything. Um, <laughs> Um, but I did work for the National Park Service uh, for 40 years. Um, so the Park Service turned 100 uh, this past year, and I worked for 40 of those years. So I have a, a few opinions about uh, the service and its future. And I'm going to sort of talk about that a little bit. Um, since uh, we are here in the John Hope Franklin Institute, I want to um, point out that uh, Dr. Franklin served as the chair of the National Park System Advisory Board in 2001. Um, and he uh, wrote a report uh, to the Secretary of the Interior at that time. And I want to read uh, from that, uh, from Dr. Franklin's, and these are actually his, his words. The public looks upon the national parks almost as a metaphor for America itself. But there is another image emerging here, a picture of the National Park Service as a sleeping giant Beloved and respected, yes, but perhaps too cautious, too resistant to change, too reluctant to engage the challenges that must be addressed in the 21st century. We are a species whose influence on natural systems is profound, yet the consequences of this influence remain only dimly understood. Our increased numbers have altered terrestrial and marine systems, strained resources and caused extinction rates never before seen, as developed landscapes press against and surround many parks, pollutants in both air and water impact park resources. Our growing numbers encourage a drifting away from knowledge about nature and our own history as a nation and a people. The times call for respected voices to join in confronting those issues that can educate and inspire, leading to greater self-awareness and national pride. The National Park Service should be one of these voices. So during my tenure as the director, I've been awakening the giant, to, so to speak, to raise the, the voice of the National Park Service for the benefit of the nation, to sort of address many of these challenging issues. And at that, at that sort of core, of which I believe are sort of these core American values where which uh, the National Park Service stand, and I think there's sort of no better institution, no better sort of high profile than the Park Service, particularly uh, during our centennial, to sort of build relevancy, to remind American citizens of, of our responsibilities. So let's, let's sort of start with <clears throat> that we just went through a relatively contentious uh, election. Um, there was a lot of talk about what divides our nation, uh, red state, blue state, you know, black, brown, white, Christian, Mormon, Muslim, Jew, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, rich, poor, urban, rural, all those kinds of things that, that sort of div divide us. And I think we need a few things that remind us of what, what binds us together. And, and I think, again, these are sort of core values that represent the country. So let's start out on this journey. I'm going to sort of take you down this journey of how the national parks represent these core American values. If you look at the founding documents of our nation, the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution, you can look right in there and see these things that, uh, that bind us. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women are created equal, endowed with their creator with certain unalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then, of course, the Constitution gives us our desire to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. Ken Burns, who's a friend of mine in his film, he once said, we have a little too much pluribus and not enough unum. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about the unum. What are those things that uh, sort of bind us uniquely as citizens? We save what we value. Um, and over the last 100 years, uh, we have set aside over 400 places um, as national parks because they represent uh, our sort of national character. 
Um, they define the American experience. <clears throat> Becoming a national park is not easy. Uh, it's a, it tends to be a long, drawn-out public battle, um, lots of study, lots of debate, an act of Congress, or a presidential proclamation. Um, these places are of our highest national significance. Um, we choose these great landscapes or these most important historical sites as our cultural heritage. And yes, the White House is a unit of the national park system. I have nothing to do with what goes on inside. Um, uh, but the, the building itself belongs to the Park Service, uh, the grounds, and we do all of its operations and maintenance. So I'm going to talk about a guidebook to American values that are found in our national parks. At our fundamental sort of core value, we value freedom. And that freedom from foreign rule, from tyranny, from taxation without representation, and the place that that was established, of course, is Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Um, it is a national park. <clears throat> but even though we signed that uh, document of Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, uh, we were a nation that was soon splitting apart. And if we talk about the United States has never been as divided, you just need to take a couple trips to a few battlefields like Manassas or Antietam or Cedar Creek or, uh, or Gettysburg to understand that just 150 years ago, we were killing each other. Uh, over 600,000 American citizens uh, were either killed or injured during our Civil War. Sort of fundamental to the American values is, is equality. And we see this in the national parks across the system that, that talk about our pursuit for civil rights. And Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail, where in the aftermath of a very violent confrontation with peaceful protesters that all they really wanted to do was to be able to register to vote, uh, you can see Dr. King there leading the 54-mile march to get passage of the Voting Rights Act. You can also see this at places like Brown v. Board and Little Rock Central High in Arkansas, uh, where we honor really the fight to ensure that all of our children had equal access to education. We can see it in Seneca Falls, which is where Women's Rights National Historic Park is, where five women organized really the first women's rights convention in 1848 and, and asserted uh, that both men and women uh, were created equal and demanded uh, something that we take for granted now is that the women had a right to vote. That was radical at the time. There are a few places that uh, sometimes don't get recognized. This is Federal Hall in New York City at 26 Wall Street, just right across the street from the financial center of the, of the nation. This is where George Washington took the oath of office is our first president. It was the home of the first Congress, the Supreme Court, and the executive branch, all in this one building uh, at, the, at the beginnings of our nation. And right across the water is, uh, from Federal Hall, is probably the most recognized symbol of democracy and freedom in the world, the Statue of Liberty. And by her side, just down off to, the, to behind there, is Ellis Island as well. Ellis Island from 1892 to 1954, 12 million people passed through what is called America's Golden Door. And though we continually are debating um, the laws around immigration policies, uh, we are a nation of immigrants. And in many ways, it is, it is our strength. One of the things that we have been doing with the National Park Service over the last eight years, and particularly this last year, this last year, in 100 national parks, uh, we conducted citizenship ceremonies with the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, um, having brand new citizens to our nation take the oath of American citizenship. And where we're better than on the deck of the Constitution or the steps of the Lincoln Memorial or even in the hot Death Valley uh, National Park to sort of you know, we're better to sort of imbue them with a, a sense of patriotism about their new country. You know, our nation uh, has probably no more classic value than that sort of pioneering spirit, the readiness to sort of take on the unknown. And that spirit is alive and well in Homestead, National Monument of America. That's its actual title. In, in Beatrice uh, 
uh, Nebraska, tells the story of how 1.6 million people went out <clears throat> to homestead on over 200 million acres uh, and put their stake in the ground and live out the American dream. In the sort of vein of frontiering, um, Lewis and Clark National Historic Park, which is, and the, and the trail celebrates the 4,000 mile journey that uh, Lewis and Clark led and looking for a route to the Pacific, a water route to the Pacific. And we tell this story now in a, in a much more multiple perspective. We talk about it from the standpoint of, of York, who was William Clark's slave. Um, that uh, accompanied him on the entire trip, uh, was given the opportunity to vote uh, at several points along the way and in sort of a very democratic sense uh, about where they would go next. Um, and also from the perspective of the Native American tribes that frankly saved Lewis and Clark multiple times from starvation. Um, I think they fed them a lot of their dogs, but um, still, um, they, uh, they saved them not really realizing that, that this expedition was actually a military expedition ultimately, which would lead settlers into the area and the resulting loss of lands from the Native American community. You know, ingenuity is such a big part of the American experience that we often call it American ingenuity. It sort of precedes the word ingenuity with the term, and you can really find this at uh, in West Orange, New Jersey, at uh, at Thomas Edison's lab, uh, which is a great trip sometime. You can check it out. I was just there recently. He generated 1,093 patents uh, in his little lab there from the phonograph to the battery. Um, or another one along the ingenuity class is uh, certainly the work of, of the Wright brothers uh, in, in Dayton, Ohio, and then in Kitty Hawk, uh, North Carolina, uh, where when you really learn the story of the Wright brothers, it is a story of repeated failures, um, uh, time and a time again at, at a variety of things, but they had a goal, and that goal was to create human flight, which they ultimately succeeded. We have a long tradition in this nation of hard work, and um, in many cases, our rivers were some of the hardest working rivers. Um, this one in Patterson, Great Falls, New Jersey, uh, was really the pioneering of the textile industry that sort of harnessed the power of these, of these rivers and, and really triggering an economic boom that set the nation on a path of becoming a, a world trade power. Not too far from Patterson is Lowell National Historic Park in Massachusetts, which um, if you want to really uh, go there, you've got to go there and be in the room full of the machines when they're all running at the same time and recognize that these were predominantly run by young women um, and in an absolutely deafening and scary environment because these machines are clacking away with all kinds of open moving parts with very little safety. Um, but at the turn of the century, this was this is where many, many women went to work. It's not all about work. Um, it's also about fun. Um, and I would say, as I said at the beginning, the Declaration of Independence said we have the right to pursue happiness, and I think the National Park Service is the only federal agency with a requirement to ensure that you do have fun. Um, um, we have the enjoyment of our parks for future generations. Um, and there are lots of great places to do that uh, in the national parks, Cuyahoga Valley National Park, the Appalachian Trail, Pacific Crest Trail, great places to, to have fun. Um, or even some of our beaches, uh, Gateway National Recreation Area, Cape Hatteras, not too far from here. Um, these are places that the Park Service has been entrusted with as recreation areas to go and just have some fun and blow off a little steam, which I think some of the students will be doing in the next few days. Um, if you want to take adventure to the extreme, you can go to down the Colorado River in Grand Canyon uh, National Park. Pretty great adventure. I've done that trip. That's, uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, or you can do a, a summit climb, uh, Denali, uh, Mount Rainier. I've summited Mount Rainier a couple times. Uh, fantastic trip. Uh, not always that much fun, but um, uh, always exciting as well. Our nation has a long history of valuing courage as well and sort of defending our ideals and standing up for the principles. And we see that 
uh, in Shanksville, Pennsylvania at Flight 93, uh, where we'll you know, always remember uh, the 40 passengers and crew on that United flight who gave their lives to prevent the attack on the USS Capitol on September 11, 2001. Um, I was uh, there on the 10th anniversary. I've been very, very involved with the families, the survivor families at Flight 93 throughout my career. And um, we were there, and President Clinton was one of our speakers, and he said that he had looked back in history, and he did not, could not find any, any particular time in history where just a group of citizens, not a you know, group of trained military or anything, but just a group of citizens organized themselves within minutes and actually created a response uh, to this kind of attack, unique in history. So we see also in the military sort of parks across the national park system, including the military cemeteries, the Park Service um, plays stewardship to over 170,000 members of the military that are buried within national park units uh, across our, our system. So burial grounds are at Antietam and Gettysburg and Yorktown and Fort McHenry and Shiloh and Andersonville and Petersburg. And you really can stand on the ground that is, that is christened with the blood of these American citizens. For those that defended America on foreign shores, you can go to the Vietnam, to World War II and the Korean War memorials in the National Mall, all protected and interpreted by the Park Service. And one of our favorite things, there's a lot of World War II veterans that are coming in and going. There's actually, there was a flight uh, as I was coming in, uh, leaving Washington, D.C. They were arriving, headed out to the World War II memorial. Very, very moving experience to be with those, with those individuals. And then if you really want to see it firsthand, uh, you can go and stand above the deck of the USS Arizona at the um, War in the Pacific, Valor in the Pacific National Monument in Hawaii, um, yeah, which was attacked uh, some 76 years ago. And, you know, the USS Arizona sank after being hit, uh, and there are 1,102 sailors still aboard uh, the ship. Um, if you served uh, on the Arizona, and there are not very many people still alive that did, you can be reburied uh, on the memorial uh, on the ship something the Park Service facilitates uh, for your ashes to be placed in the ship amongst your fellow sailors. And I've dived there with our scuba divers uh, in doing that is a very, very powerful event. So as our men and women in uniform are sort of engaged uh, around the world, we think that you know, it is something that their sacrifice and their service value uh, more than most things. And it is really something that that, uh, that binds us together. And there are many memorials and monuments of the National Park Service that also try to remind us that we should commit to a peaceful world, um, that these are places not just to remember the sacrifice, but to commit to the future that we don't have to build any more of these at some point. I think one of the things I feel the most proud about about the National Park Service and the sort of core American values that that we're, we're not afraid to talk about uh, the dark periods of our past, the sort of tough uncomfortableness of that, and we're, we speak about it honestly. So as we were entering the 150th anniversary or the commemoration of the Civil War, we brought together scholars uh, of the Civil War, and we said we're, going, we're not going to rewrite history, we're going to correct history, um, that the Civil War was not about states' rights or that little unpleasantness or the war of northern aggression. Um, it was about slavery. Slavery was the cause of the Civil War. And it, its net result of finally uh, four million enslaved individuals becoming free and, and were at the heart of the conflict. Certainly, a century and a half ago, President Lincoln issued his Emancipation Proclamation and it took effect, uh, but that that really wasn't delivered to almost 100 years after that uh, when legal civil rights were achieved. One of the places that I've been very actively involved in my career is the Japanese American internment sites. And uh, this is Manzanar, um, also very involved with Minidoka and Tule Lake and Hana Uliuli, and where uh, there were 10 camps um, and more than 120,000 Japanese 
citizen, Japanese American citizens, many, most of them American citizens born in the United States, uh, were gathered up and incarcerated uh, for uh, three years or more uh, for no other reason than their ethnicity. Um, and um, we have not concealed this story. It's one that needs to be told, particularly in light of wartime racial hysteria uh, that still uh, is pervasive at times in our nation. So we use these sites for lessons learned. One of the great things that we have been doing uh, with our grants program is bringing um, high school and college kids, both that are of Japanese American ethnicity and Muslim, uh, to come to this place uh, and, uh, and learn about its history um, and how we can hope to prevent the same kind of thing happening in the future. <clears throat> a few years ago, uh, President Obama created the 398th National Monument for the Park Service, Cesar Chavez uh, in Keene, California. And one of my really proudest moments in working with uh, Cesar's family, uh, he still has kids and grandkids that are there. They're still sort of maintaining his legacy uh, of his work to uh, provide protection to the farm workers of, of California, Arizona, and others, not just the Hispanic community, but the Filipino community as well. And so, um, the, you know, th this would have been one of my goals for a long time, was to finally get uh, our opportunity for the National Park Service to be able to tell the Chavez story. Um, and of course, they were protecting that story uh, within their family traditions. And so they all got together and they went to Manzanar. Um, you know, not talking to us, of course. And they went up there and um, came back and said, we can trust the National Park Service. If they can tell that story at Manzanar, we can trust them with their father's story um, at, um, at Keene. And that confidence uh, has allowed us to pursue other stories, uh, under, under told stories in America. So under President Obama, we have added national monuments for Harriet Tubman for Belmont Paul Women's Equality, uh, for the Pullman Porter site in Chicago, uh, for Reconstruction at Penn Center, for Freedom Riders in Anniston, Alabama, uh, the Birmingham uh, bomb site, 16th Street Baptist Church, and Kelly Ingram Park uh, in Birmingham, and Stonewall, uh, the site of the LGBTQ sort of uprising uh, in Greenwich Village in New York. All been added uh, under Obama and are part of the national park system as well. Our nation's history with the Native American community is really, really fraught with war and bloodshed and discrimination. But it was the, really what triggered, I think, uh, in our history um, was the looting of the Anasazi sites, these ancient Puebloan sites like Mesa Verde, um, which was being looted legally because there was no protection under the law, resulted essentially by a, a group of women uh, in that part of the country who galvanized a movement to protect these sites uh, with ultimately the Archaeological Resources Protection Act and the Antiquities Act. And it also spawned a great respect for cultural heritage of all kinds in our nation. <clears throat> and really through scholarly research and bringing in the Native voice, this getting multiple perspectives, we begin to understand that Native communities had art and language and architecture and very complex societies long with millions and millions of people living here long before America was discovered. Uh, by, by Columbus. Our country has faced uh, over its uh, couple hundred years many crises and at those times great leaders have arisen um, and we recognize them like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt. They, they stare out at us, give us sort of patriotic um, emotions from Mount Rushmore um, as well and we have monuments and other memorials and presidential homes across the country. It's not all about elected leaders, though. <clears throat> During my time as the director, we were able to dedicate the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial, um, really the first memorial on the National Mall to an African-American leader. You know, from that uh, mountain of despair, Dr. King emerges as a stone of hope, literally steps away from where he stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and delivered his I Have a Dream speech during the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. There are other lesser known folks out there like Colonel Charles Young, second African-American to graduate from West Point, 
commanding officer of the Buffalo Soldiers, uh, who rightfully should have been promoted from colonel ultimately to general. He had an extraordinary record. Um, but basically, the military trumped up uh, an assertion that he was not healthy enough uh, to be promoted. It was clearly racism. Um, he was based uh, in Ohio at the time. He got on his horse and rode to Washington, D.C. Uh, from Ohio to show that he was, uh, he was plenty healthy. Um, we, uh, we got his home uh, as a new national monument, Colonel Charles Young, Buffalo Soldiers National Monument, also in this administration. So Ken Burns said that the, the national parks are the Declaration of Independence applied to the land. Essentially, you can stand in these incredible places, whether you're rich or poor, um, and, and appreciate that they belong to you. This is Mount Rainier National Park. I served as the superintendent there. As I mentioned, I climbed the mountains a few times. But it's also a great example of what we're seeing from a climate change standpoint. Um, Rainier uh, is in the Cascades. Uh, it gets a lot of snow. Um, but what we have seen is a significant change in the way snow and snowpack uh, persist uh, on the Cascades, Rainier being a great example of that. Traditionally and historically, uh, it would begin to snow in the fall, get 1,000 inches of snow or more <clears throat> at Paradise, um, which is mostly up the mountain. Um, and then in the spring, as this would, in the northwest, it would begin to rain, uh, and that snow would just sort of soak up all that rain like a great big sponge and then release it uh, throughout the summer into downstream flows. What we've seen as a result of global warming and climate change is that that event, now we get rain on snow in the fall. And so there's not as much snowpack. And so what that rain does is actually melts the snow and we have extraordinary flooding. And so facilities that have been existing on Mount Rainier for, for 100 years are just being scoured right out to bedrock. We had a campground, uh, one of our nicest little campgrounds called Sunshine Point because it was one of the places that in the spring uh, the sun really shone, which rarely does in the Northwest, but this was a great spot for it. Um, it was just completely obliterated. Uh, over $35 million worth of damage uh, with this kind of change to the, to the regimen um, of the park. So it's pretty hard to um, not feel a little bit of a rush of pride uh, when you stand uh, along the rim of the Grand Canyon or in the Alpen Glow, the Grand Tetons, or under the giant sequoias and in the, in the Sierras, these are, these are our cathedrals. And I think as Americans, we have this sort of strong bond with the land. We sort of identify it with it personally. We consider it part of our national character. And we understood this early on um, that we needed to protect it. We needed to create a conservation movement that would protect these kinds of places. And that is what Stegner called America's best idea. And some of it, um, really started with some very early workings of George Perkins Marsh. Uh, he, was a, he was a writer and he thought a lot about conservation. Um, early conservation farming by Frederick Billings and the philanthropy of Lawrence Rockefeller and it's all embodied at this place in, in Woodstock, Vermont, uh, at the Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historical Park. But when you go there, you're gonna find out that the guys took all the credit but the women did all the work. Um, all three of their wives were really at the core of this movement. The guys were off, you know, writing about it and taking all the credit as they typically do. One of the other unique things about conservation in the nation is that it, some of it began as a private enterprise. And so there were those that made a lot of money, um, you know, achieved the American dream, um, and they wanted to, to give back through protecting special places. And so the Rockefeller family is a great example. They basically donated almost all of the lands that created Acadia National Park. Um, and the same is true with the Virgin Islands National Park. The Rockefeller family basically bought most of the island of St. John and donated it to the National Park Service uh, for its preservation. So if you go there, have some fun, uh, but think about that from a conservation standpoint and from a private sector standpoint as well. During the centennial uh, of the National Park Service, we made a huge effort to engage the philanthropic community. Um, one of your uh, alumni, David Rubenstein, um, 
donated over $45 million uh, to the National Park Service. Um, and then uh, we raised about $340 million during the centennial. And one of the greatest gifts, it's actually the largest land gift in the history of the National Park Service was by Roxanne Quinby, uh, the founder of Burt's Bees, uh, probably some Burt's Bee product users in the room. Um, uh, she, uh, in her creation of the Burt's Bees company, um, discovered that she could buy land uh, in Maine, mostly cut over second growth forest in the northern Maine area next to Baxter, for about the same amount of money it cost her to ship her product. So the land was that cheap. So over 20, 25 years, she accumulated 87,000 acres of North Maine Woods lands, contiguous with, with Baxter. And she donated all of that to the National Park Service in our centennial, along with a $20 million endowment. So not too shabby. Um, so in my, in my 40 years um, with the service, um, I have seen this sort of core value um, that of our sort of willingness to restrain ourselves, that from overwhelming places like Yellowstone um, or Yosemite, from you know, what the rest of the nation, from technology, from development, um, and at their best, these places now, as we think about the future, really serve as sort of anchors. They are kind of nodes in a broader landscape, and how can we create something that connects them together into an ecosystem that is at least the functional equivalent of a much larger uh, protected area as well. So these places, you know, whether it's Shenandoah National Park or Zion National Park, they are, to me, a collective expression of who we are as a people. They are a mosaic of the things that we, we value about ourselves. And they often represent sort of where the, the fires rage the hottest in, a, in protecting those values as well. And we feel the commitment that we must create a connection to the next generation as we hand off the stewardship of these places, an intergenerational handoff to the millennial generation in particular who must step up and take this. And we believe that contact with these places builds relevancy, and relevancy leads to advocacy uh, for their protection. So, you know, I'm very proud of the, of the work of the National Park Service and our many partners that have been entrusted with this, with this obligation uh, to the American people to protect these places. So in 2016 was our 100th anniversary, and we went about it saying we weren't just going to have a big birthday cake and have a, a big celebration, even though we did a lot of that. Um, but we were going to go about the centennial with a great deal of intentionality around connecting with and creating this next generation of visitors and advocates and supporters, not only for the national park system, but for the larger conservation movement as well as sort of the larger parks and public land estate uh, out there that is such, so important to uh, our survival. The results uh, from our centennial are pretty astonishing. I mean, we went about this in a very strong way. We had 16 billion media impressions. I have no idea what that means, but they tell me it's good. Um, the, um, our, our volunteer program went from 250,000 to 440,000 volunteers. Um, one in four millennials uh, we reached with our public awareness campaign, the Find Your Park campaign. There were over 3,000 events, books, movies, songs, poetry uh, uh, across the nation to celebrate the centennial. Congress. Uh, appropriated our largest budget in history and passed landmark bipartisan centennial legislation, which is kind of unheard of. Um, and visitation, um, we exceeded uh, 320 million visitors last year, which is more than all of national football, national baseball, national basketball, soccer, NASCAR, and Disney combined. <laughs> <laughs> And I like to say we run that on the budget of the city of Austin, Texas, which is about $2.9 billion. Um, so there was a lot to celebrate uh, in the centennial. Um, but um, we still need to be thinking about um, the future. It was not all looking back. It's all, it's all really looking forward. So 
we see, I think, at, at a very deep way, that we need to connect people to these places. We need to get kids and adults and millennials out into their parks and their public lands. Uh, and we think it's critical. It's critical for the social fabric of the nation. It's critical for conservation. It's critical for sustaining the environment that, that sustains us. Uh, it was also uh, an effort to create citizen science. Um, and we had the bio blitzes, and we had every kid in a park. Um, we had so many different ways that we were connecting the next generation to understand the scientific stewardship that's going to be required uh, for future generations as well. So in Washington, D.C., where I've, I've worked the last eight years, and one of my favorite places is the Lincoln Memorial. And our 16th president sits there in that big marble chair, and he sort of stares out down that line of the National Mall past the Washington Monument to our, our first president, George Washington, and on in the horizon, end of the horizon there, you can see the U.S. Capitol where Congress deliberates the laws that govern the nation. And I remember, you know, Abraham Lincoln was, you know, was often called Honest Abe. <clears throat> but those that, his critics suggested that um, he wasn't honest, but he was two-faced. And he responded, if I were two-faced, would I be wearing this one? Um, <laughs> so inscribed on the wall, uh, if you've spent time in the Lincoln, is the Gettysburg Address on one side and the Second Inaugural Address on the other side. Second Inaugural Address delivered only 41 days before he was assassinated at Forge Theater, which is all part, also part of the park system. And I sometimes wonder what he's thinking uh, about our nation uh, the nation that he worked so hard to preserve. So I want to um, end there with, but, but with an invitation uh, to each and every one of you to uh, get out there and find your park, uh, find some place in the National Park Service that, um, that means something to you, uh, but don't go alone. Um, you need to bring a kid, uh, you need to bring a millennial or a group of millennials uh, out there and, uh, and begin to talk about uh, what these places mean uh, to our nation uh, and to each and every one of you. So thank you, and I'll open it up for questions. <laughs> Initially, uh, thank you very much for coming. And you essentially just touched on the point, but I just want to focus on that the younger generation, millennials, myself, that technology is becoming it's more and more ingrained into our lives and how much of a problem do you think this is and just what do you think are the necessary steps to try to just get our generation to unplug and get back into nature because it, I have so many friends. I love the parks, they're the best, but I have numerous friends who, uh, I don't know, technology just seems like takes over their lives and they don't want to come into the parks. So it's a great question and it's a, it's a really interesting question because when I I'm on the speaker circuit, and I'm oft, often talked to sort of a traditional park service -y, you know, public lands crowd, which tends to be, you know, older. They're like, you know, tell those millennials to leave that, leave that technology, you know, home. And I, I, my typical response is, so you're still hiking in wool and carrying a wicker pack? Uh, you know, uh, you're not, your pack's not carbon fiber, and you're not using a little stove that's, you know, uh, and so we're picking on one technology and then utilizing other technologies. And so I'm actually an advocate for embracing technology, not as a substitute. Uh, you know, you can't look at the Grand Canyon on your iPhone and say, well, I was there, right? Uh, it's just not the same, right? So if technology can enhance the experience, um, uh, not as a substitute, um, then I think the Park Service needs to embrace it. Now, that doesn't mean we want cell towers, you know, on the top of all the mountains. The technology is getting to the point that you can do this. And I think within prime visitor areas, uh, we need to have stand-up wireless and have accessibility. Not at the bottom of the Grand Canyon or the top of Mount Rainier. Though I did call my wife from the top of Mount Rainier from my cell phone. Um, um, but um, I do think that um, your generation is not going to leave it at home. If we say you leave at home, they're not going to come. And so if we're, going to, if we're going to connect with and build relevancy, then we need to have connectivity. 
And, and I think the other side about that I, li I like to say is that if you look at a picture, you know, Park Service takes lots of pictures, and you look at a picture of uh, a ranger giving a program, and they've got, let's say they've got a, you know, a box turtle in their hand, and they're holding it out with a group of kids. Ten years ago, all those kids would be leaning in, looking. Today, they're all taking a picture of it, okay? They've all got their phones out, and they're doing this, right? They're sharing that phone within a broader social network. And so somewhere in that social network is another kid that will want to go do that. And so I think that that's the way I view technology. And so um, invite them out and say, bring their phones. <laughs> Talk loud. Uh, are there programs to help people use their smartphone technology to engage with uh, different aspects of the parks? You know, here's where the glaciers were that you're looking at, and you yes. can sort of, yeah. yeah. Can you yeah. talk about a, those? There, it's rapidly growing. That field, there's all kinds of, I mean, uh, it was a great one that actually won one of the awards when, we, when it was the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, um, when Dr. King delivered the I Have a Dream speech. You could literally stand on the mall with your phone and put yourself in the crowd 50 years ago. So you could actually look at the crowd as if you were in the crowd 50 years ago from various points on the mall. Um, and we're seeing more and more games, programs, and ability. Um, one of the uh, uh, app companies that we worked with during the uh, bio blitzes is iNaturalist. And so iNaturalist is a crowdsourced uh, identification program, but now you can do stars, you can do leaves, I mean there's so many different ways that you can deepen your knowledge about what you're experiencing uh, through technology. All right, is it working? Yeah, cool. Um, thanks for a great talk and um, you know I think there's so many great compelling stories that you touched on and innumerable to go with all of the, the various parks. Coming from someone who is trying to use stories as a way to impact audiences and um, and get engagement, what would you say are are two or three really important elements of those stories that you or people in the park service um, seek out um, in those displays or or um, you know communications pieces at the parks that have been the most impactful? Can I just interject as you think about the answer? Is uh, Action Directive Margaret is here. As well, and we have a workshop and story lab all day talk about effective storytelling. So, if you're interested, talk to me yeah. or Dan after. But, but sorry, I'll be but telling I'm stories just tomorrow. A little advert for tomorrow. But, yeah. So it's it's really good. I mean, the Park Service is a storyteller. I mean, that's you know we we have a huge staff. We train. We evaluate uh, uh, our employees that that tell story. We tell story through place. We have in the physical place, and that evokes a certain response. You have an opportunity with a, with a mixed audience, a very mixed audience, to be able to tell a story. We, um, we are transitioning our storytelling in a, in a, a pretty interesting way. Uh, and Julia Washburn, who was our head of education, uh, said that we're going from the sage on the stage to the guide on the side. Okay? Um, and and we traditionally were the sage on the stage. We got up and we told you like it was, right? Now it's more about guiding your own thoughts and inquiry about this place and the stories that it embodies, raising questions, and in getting sort of the audience to think about this. We're not there to convince you of something, but, but to present the information in a way that is compelling and interesting sometimes even entertaining, but it is to get you thinking uh, and that hopefully you come away with a little deeper knowledge and a little more inquiry about this story, maybe even about how it relates directly to you. To you. And I think more, more importantly and more recently, we're seeking out the, the untold stories, the stories of the LGBTQ, the stories of women, the stories of uh, minorities, uh, the, the, the dark, you know, difficult periods of our history that, you know, lynchings and reconstruction and uh, the internment of Japanese Americans and all, all of that. We feel that that 
is the story that needs to be told. Um, thank you, this is so convenient. Um, I'm curious about, uh, for you personally, why did you want to get involved with the National Park Service? Um, you said you started working there after college um, for 40 plus years. Um, so what was like a, the initial impetus to go work uh, for the Park Service? So um, I, um, I had always loved the outdoors. Um, I grew up in the uh, Shenandoah Valley of Virginia um, and was always, you know, grew up in a family that sort of kicked you out of the house and said, don't come back until dark, you know. Um, and, um, and so I knew that I wanted to work in some field associated with the outdoors, uh, but I hadn't thought about the Park Service. I went to college, William and Mary, got a degree in biology, um, and um, right out of college, I took off and did a uh, Western Swing, you know, parks trip, saw all these great parks. Um, I was intending to sort of go follow a path more into academia, uh, and, uh, and my, my brother admonished me and said, you know, you know, don't go off and study the life cycle of a liverwort, you know, go do something with your life uh, that has meaning, <laughs> and uh, that, you know, make a difference and find, find a place that you can make a difference. And, uh, and I found that in the Park Service. I, I joined it as a seasonal, with all intention of only working as a seasonal and going back to school, but uh, I wound up staying in the organization for 40 years. Hi, uh, thank you for, the, for a great talk. Um, I am a graduate student at the School of the Environment here at Duke, so um, I'm studying renewable energy. So you briefly touched on climate change at Mount Rainier, um, and I was wondering, and, and accepting uh, new technology, are there any sorts of plans? I, I know several years ago you banned plastic bottles from the parks, and recently I was in the Grand Canyon and there was you know, recycling everywhere. Um, are there any plans to incorporate uh, clean energy and, you know, in some way at the parks? Um, sure. Um, so we, we have a um, sort of a four-pronged uh, uh, approach to, to climate change um, in the Park Service. Um, and so um, one is um, science monitoring. So the parks are probably the least stressed or maybe the closest to, to natural systems we have left. So they're great monitors of climate change. So we have a major investment in, in that area. We have a adaptation strategy, uh, which is about planning for the impacts of climate change, everything from looking at you know, uh, corridors of connectivity or on our coastal environments, what's uphill, or our, in our cultural resources, how we document before we lose, those kinds of things, adapting. And I, I required by policy that every park that was going through management planning had to build that into their, their management plans. Um, there's an education side, uh, and I believe the Park Service has a responsibility and a role to talk about climate change in a place like Rainier or others where you can actually see it, you know, because the public has a hard time sort of getting their grips to it. And then the last but not least is the, our own mitigation of climate change, our own carbon footprint. And so we've done lots and lots of analyses on our carbon uh, footprint for the Park Service and what can we do um, and, you know, within large national parks, we can, we can do a lot, but we can't do, like, as much as you can do on other public lands. Uh, you would not put up a large solar array in Yosemite Valley. And you may not know it, but the top of the Alcatraz cell, cell block on Alcatraz Island is covered with solar panels. Um, and the maintenance shops at Joshua Tree are all covered with solar panels. And actually, Rainier has got solar panels in a lot of the maintenance shops and the like. And we're converting not only to solar, but to other renewable energies as much as possible. During the, the Obama administration, we had a, a very high priority on renewable energy. Uh, and so a lot of it was being cited on BLM lands. Um, and so we worked very, very closely with the Bureau of Land Management about standing up very, very large solar arrays, a lot of in the California desert, uh, the SOFL, the uh, California Desert Renewable Energy Comprehensive Plan, the DRECP, uh, was uh, something we all were very, very actively engaged in. And then even gr buying green power where it is available as well. So the Park Service feels that we needed to be somewhat of an exemplar, 
but we really, because of either cultural landscapes or other you know, areas of protection, we really couldn't do it at, at sort of industrial scale inside parks. That would not be appropriate. Thank you so much for sharing these stories. I was especially glad to hear you focus on the memorials and monuments that have been dedicated to our cultural and social leaders like Cesar Chavez and um, the dedication of Stonewall as a monument is, is really meaningful for a lot of people who maybe haven't seen themselves in represented in the parks before. But I'm curious from a kind of messaging and outreach standpoint, it still seems like the park service is for the traditional you know, environmental parks and how, what is the Park Service doing to focus on um, the fact that the Park Service is telling the stories of these social leaders and activists? Um, it's a great question. So, you know, um, sort of overcoming uh, the sort of psyche of the American people that thinks that all the national parks are out west and they all have big glaciers and mountains and bears and things like that, and that's not about them. One of the um, sort of um, components of the centennial was that <clears throat> the, we hired through our foundation a Madison Avenue, New York marketing advertising firm, Gray Advertising. And they did some analysis, and they did some um, survey work, they did a blography and others, and they said, the Park Service, you have a great brand, you don't manage your brand. And you don't brand your work. Um, and so, the brand association, which is very strong and very positive, the brand association is with the big natural areas. And that's so what we needed to do is to begin to use that brand much more visibly uh, in the cultural side of the story, um, in our publications, in our social media, uh, in our media releases, and in, then physically on the ground. Um, I mean, I remember, you know, is that uh, big celebration when we reopened the Statue of Liberty and it was Good Morning America and they said, thank you New York City Parks for what you've done. You know, and we're like, you know, you just want to smack them. You know, it's like they have nothing to do with this park. This is National Park, you know, and, but, you know, it's just sort of overcoming these uh, sort of, you know, group think that goes on around it, but we're getting there. Okay, that's great. Um, <clears throat> so, um, um, a friend of mine and I are actually writing a book uh, that will be coming out next year on the future of conservation, and, uh, and there'll be a lot of tips in that. But, um, uh, because it, it, we're not, and as opposed to the dystopian future, we're trying, yes. to per, per, we're trying to portray a positive future, that there are positives here, and that the positives lie in this next generation. Um, so I think things are, are pretty different right now than, than 40 years ago. Um, and certainly, you know, without casting too many aspersions on this ad administration, um, you know, hiring by the government is going to be very limited, if not zero, in the next. I mean, they're, they're trying to get rid of a significant portion of the federal, particularly conservation community, EPA, Park Service, Forest Service, BLM, you know, they got that... Uh, that there'll be very little job opportunity in the next four years, I think, in that. They will have to rebuild at some point, though. Um, it, it will come, because it, it, it will be, the public will demand it. And so this will be a dip. So what you want to be thinking about is if that's what you want to do, be preparing for that opportunity in four or more years. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe two. Um, 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 and um, so, to sort of get yourself uh, prepared, um, if, and I, I can speak to the Park Service and maybe to the other to other agencies. You know, we 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 love hiring people that have sort of multiple skills, not just one set of skills, but skills that of of both being in the outdoors, having some outdoor experiences, whatever they may be, um, 
and there are all kinds of conservation corps and youth corps and and uh, you know field uh, science and working with kids and you know outdoor leadership you know kinds of things that you can gain that that kind of level of experience. I think during this sort of down dump in the in the federal sector, the NGO community is going to rise, and I, so I think that conservation organizations, traditional and new ones, there are new conservation organizations emerging around environmental justice, around minority serving, you know, like out, uh, Outdoors Afro or Latino Outdoors that are reaching and connecting with uh, communities. There's a lot of great innovation going on in the urban park environments, things like the High Line in, in New York City, where parks are being created that we don't yet understand its their relationship uh, to the broad, larger landscape, but they may be critical. I remember there was a park I visited in Chicago that had just been restored. It had been a side yard on the railroad where there were abandoned cars and, you know, it was just total trash. They re the community organized, repaired it, and it's now, it has monarch butterflies stopping by. Um, so um, I think there's a whole field of restoration ecology out there to get involved in. Um, and, you know, grassroots organization, uh, I think. So there's a lots of place to sort of build your, your portfolio. Uh, and I would look to build it kind of broadly um, because you, you'll come out of school with a fair amount of expertise in, you know, one or, th one or two things. Over this next few years, build it more broadly and you'll be more attractive, both to the NGO community as well as to the, uh, to the agencies. Um, you just uh, touched on my, the, the, the first part of my question, but the National Park Service has been in the news quite a bit lately related to a couple of new national parks, which I presume were developed under your leadership, which are now being squashed by the new administration. And I'm just wondering if you can talk about that process. So um, what, what I know right now is that I think today, President Trump is issuing an executive order today. I think it's today. It's today, right? Yeah, he's, he's issuing an executive order uh, directing Secretary of Interior Ryan Zinke to do a review of all of the uses of the Antiquities Act back to President Clinton. Uh, um, so to go back, and so there's roughly 50 or so monuments been established back to Clinton, sort of going back to Grand Staircase Escalante and then right up to Bears Ears, sort of those are your bookends if you want to look at it. And within that, not all of those are Park Service. Some of them are BLM, some of them are Forest Service, and some of them are Park Service. And we don't really know, I haven't seen the text of his executive order. There's a, there's a really interesting legal discussion going on or, uh, in the broader legal community about whether or not the president actually has the power to de-designate these sites. Congress certainly does, but whether the president can do it unilaterally is an open legal question. The Antiquities Act says he can create them, doesn't say he can uncreate them, right? So uh, what he's asked for is a review. Now, I, I, and uh, Zinke says he's gonna do it over the next 120 days and then provide a report to the president. Um, uh, and then who knows what will happen. I'm sure we'll read about it or hear about it on a tweet right after that. So, so uh, it's actually officially over and I sometimes have to get back to work, but do you mind for just maybe a couple more minutes? Sure. Are you sure? Yeah. No? I got no place to go. Yeah, okay. So those of you who are welcome, you're welcome to stay. Yeah, you're welcome to stay. Thanks Mosey for squeezing me in. <laughs> um, so r related to all of this, I was interested um, to hear a little bit about what you think about the budget uh, situation for the National Park Service and and sort of avenues for advocacy. I belong to an organization called the National Parks Conservation Association, and of course, um, they like to write all these dire letters about how everything's falling apart in all the national parks, and you've got to give them some money because um, <laughs> they need help, and their budget's been cut so much over the years, and so on. And I, I was interested in, in your perspective on on that, and generally when Trump does whatever he's doing today, like what can we do? Great question. So um, 
the Park Service, uh, it, just from a budgetary standpoint, is a, what I, I call an operational agency. We're not a grant-making agency. We, we run parks. That's what we do with our money. We get money from Congress and we operate parks. And uh, we hire rangers and we take care of maintenance. And um, We have a very log ma large maintenance backlog. Um, Park Service has 17,000 buildings um, and five or 6,000 miles of paved road. And I don't know how, I forget how many bridges and tunnels and all this stuff. And wastewater treatment plants and water systems and, and you know, all those buildings, most of them are historic. Um, and um, so we have to take care of them. So over time, Congress has been very stingy uh, with the budget. And, um, and so we've, we've built up a backlog. And then operationally, uh, we've been in decline. We got a, a nice bump in 2009. We got a nice bump of our budget in 16. But I like to say we're a, a perpetuity organization on an annual appropriation. Um, and, and Congress has trouble even annually appropriating any money. I mean, they, I mean here we are looming with a shutdown at the end of the week. Uh, because we're on a continuing resolution. Um, and we have no idea what Congress is going to do. Uh, they, could, they could rescind some of our budget. This is for this fiscal year. And then two weeks after whatever they do with fiscal 17, they've got to start fiscal 18. And there's not even a proposal for 18 yet. So this is a very difficult way to run an organization when you have, to have no idea whether you have any money or not. Um, and that's a problem. Um, in PCA uh, and others lobby relatively effectively uh, uh, not all of their dire uh, projections are going to come true. Uh, just keep that in mind. Um, but um, your support uh, for seeing the Park Service have a sustainable and predictable budget would be a good thing. We need that. Very, very difficult for the field. And there are calls for significant cuts, uh, you know, not as draconian as EPA or some of the others. Um, uh, and you know, what they typically do in these kinds of administrations is they hold the Park Service a little bit unharmed while they really destroy the budgets of the other agencies. And so it's a little bit of a greenwash uh, for the administration if they just fund the Park Service. So uh, while I'm parochial about it, I also worry about the rest of our agencies at the same time. Okay, well, thank you all. Thank yeah. You. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.